Welcome and thank you for joining today's Chief FOIA Officers Council meeting. Please note this conference is being recorded and all audio connections are muted at this time. If you require technical assistance, please open chat with the associated icon at the bottom of your screen and send a message to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the conference over to Bobby Talibian, Director, Office of Information Policy at the Department of Justice and Council Co-Chair. Thank you and good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to our fall 2024 public meeting of the Chief Four Officers Council. Um, I am Bobby Sleeping, Director of the Office of Information Policy, and very excited to be here joined by Martha Murphy, um, Deputy Director of OGIS, who is standing in today for OGIS Director Alina Simo. We're looking forward to a great meeting today uh, with another packed uh, agenda. We're really pleased that so many of you are able to join us today. We're simultaneously live streaming this meeting on the National Archives YouTube channel. Anyone who misses this meeting or wishes to go back and listen to portions of it may do so at any time. And for our agenda today, we're very happy to uh, start off by welcoming Daniel Schumann, chair of the newly established Open Government Federal Advisory Committee. The Open Government Federal Advisory Committee serves as an advisory body to the GSA administrator on federal open government, open government and public engagement efforts, including developing US national, action, US national action plans, efforts to increase the public's access to data, advance equity and engage the public in the regulatory process, making government records more accessible and improving delivery of government services and benefits. I have the privilege of also serving as a member of the new committee and very excited and uh, thankful for Daniel for joining us today because I believe the committee's mission and our work in FOIA could not be more aligned. Um, we've had several prior NAP initiatives um, that have focused on FOIA. And of course, you can't have open government without FOIA. Then we will um, move on and Martha and I will uh, both provide updates on, our, on the work of our respective offices, OIP and OGIS, um, followed by uh, Lindsay Steele, Chief of OIP's compliance staff, updating us on developments of the FOIA business standards and we'll then uh, close out um, the, the meeting with our re readouts from our two councils committees, the technology committee and the committee on cross agency collaboration and innovation. Uh, and we hope that their work continues to inspire uh, more volunteers. Um, it's an exciting way to for us to be able to network and further the um, pushing ball forward for FOIA. Great, next slide, please. Just a few housekeeping things. Uh, we reserve time at the end of today's session for public comments. We will open the telephone line at the end of our meeting for any oral questions or chat comments from those members of the public who have registered to participate via our WebEx platform. Please limit your oral public comments to three minutes. Once your three minutes expire, we'll mute your line and move on to the next commenter or questions or comments pending in the WebEx chat. During the course of the meeting, we will pause if there are any questions from our agency FOIA colleagues that come in via WebEx chat, and we'll share them as appropriate. Important reminder, please, be sure to send a chat to all panelists to ensure that your comments are seen by our moderators. Next slide, please. Excellent. Um, so without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome Daniel Schumann to speak to us about the new Open Government Federal Advisory Committee. Daniel is the Executive Director of the American Governance Institute, a nonprofit organization focused on strengthening the institutions of American government. He is well known for his expertise with respect to government, accountability and transparency, the appropriation process, legislative branch operations and congressional rules and procedures. Uh, again, very grateful for you for joining us, Daniel, and uh, thanks again. Over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Bobby. It's it's such a pleasure uh, to be joining you and everyone else. Um, uh, the work that you all do here is incredibly important. FOIA is a uh, you know a foundational element of open government. And and Bobby, I just really appreciate both the kind introduction and uh, the fact that we get to keep collaborating in different venues at different times. So I'm here to talk uh, just a little bit a little bit about the um, open government. Uh, Federal Advisory Committee, but I want to take just a moment to put it in context. Um, as everyone knows, uh, 
every other year, uh, the United States government goes through this process of creating a national action plan uh, for open government as part of a broader open government partnership. Uh, comments uh, with respect to um, this, um, this effort, this national action plan, uh, the public comments are due by November 12th, and there is a federal register notice uh, for members of the public and for others who wish to engage in it. Um, when that process closes, the Open Government Secretariat, which is an entity inside the General Services Administration, is going to look at the, the comments that's received from there and the comments from its public consultations and elsewhere, and will help um, uh, the White House, help the administration come up with a series of recommendations uh, for what the U.S. should commit to uh, over the next two-year cycle. The role of the Open Government Federal Advisory Committee uh, is related to this process. Uh, it's a GSA-created advisory committee uh, composed of both government and non-governmental members. And our job is to provide uh, independent expert advice as to what should be included in that plan. And our recommendations will go to the GSA administer, administrator, and uh, that person will make a determination as to um, uh, whether to forward those recommendations on uh, more broadly. We have just begun our work. We had our first meeting. Our first official meeting was last month. And the um, the Open Government Federal Advisory Committee, or the OG FAC, because people have a funny sense of humor in terms of how we named it, um, uh, will be having monthly meetings for the next couple of months to figure out, one, how we can have an open process to receive information from everyone who might be interested, and also to figure out what recommendations uh, that is that we wish to make. And we want to hear from everyone. Uh, you know, certainly we want to hear from the public, but we also want to hear and have conversations with uh, agency officials. You are the ones who are responsible for administering uh, and overseeing um, and making recommendations on both the public disclosure and the uh, reactive disclosure provisions of FOIA. And you see how it really works. Um, so I want to issue an open invitation to everybody who is um, uh, in attendance today or those who might see, you know, might see this conversation later on to please reach out to the Open Government Federal Advisory Committee. We have, uh, we can receive comments at OGFAC, OGFAC at gsa.gov. Uh, you can always reach out to me or any of the members of the, of the OGFAC um, if you have information that you want to submit or if you want to have a conversation. Like I said, we're looking to hear from everyone. If you have good ideas, we would love to hear them. We're looking in particular for things that are uh, measurable, that are implementable, and that make the world a better place uh, as relates to transparency, accountability, open government, and participation. So with that, um, I'll, I think I'll stop here. If there are questions or comments, I'm, I'm more than happy to address them now. Thank you. We'll just pause to see if there's any, any questions from our agency folks. I'm not scary, please. <laughs> this is, you know, I, I, I'd love to talk about this more and I'd love to hear what you have to say. Well, I would say, um, and, you know, uh, of the prior five NAPs, four of them had FOIA initiatives. And I think it's really important that FOIA makes its way into, into these NAPs and that we continue to build on uh, and uh, how we're going to improve FOIA uh, um, and having it as part of a national action plan. Uh, commitment it really helps us become even more ambitious in what these initiatives are. So I, I uh, encourage all our colleagues here to, uh, if not today, reach out to the the committee and Daniel with thoughts, ideas, concerns, and um, ways we can do better. And, and and just on that point, we know that civil society and others will have many recommendations about the things that we want. Um, it is hard for those on the outside to see the challenges that those folks on the inside face when trying to address problems or the problems that you might otherwise have. Uh, if we're going to make 10 or 15 recommendations total, they should be recommendations that are doable. I don't want, I, you know, I don't want to ask for things in such a way that um, you would not be able to, you know, the agencies would not be able to manage it. So if there are places, if there are, if there are places where Intervention makes the most sense. You can help make sure um, that we that we function properly. So I, I do see that there is a, a question in the chat about um, how the committee will be organizing itself and will there be working groups and subcommittees? So I'm happy to answer that question. Um, the answer is we don't know yet. Um, we, we just we've had our our first meeting and 
as part of that first meeting, we have set up um, three sort of little groups to look at. One, how do we measure um, um, which ideas we want to make it and which ideas that don't want to make it uh, sort of into, into the into the further recommendations. The second is how do we engage with the public because there really isn't guidance for, for how we do that. And the third one is, is responsive to this question, which is will there be working groups or subcommittees? Uh, as it turns out, under uh, the Federal Advisory Committee Act, it is fairly challenging to create subcommittees on an expedited basis. Um, so we may end up creating subcommittees, but it would take 60 to 90 days before we can stand them up. And they would be composed of uh, most likely the members of the Federal Advisory Committee. So it is, it is eminently possible that we'll create subcommittees either topically uh, to deal with particular subject matter or um, to deal with the different types of work that the, the advisory committee does. We don't just do work on the national action plan. We'll also be making suggestions on emergent uh, transparency issues for the US government, but it is simply too soon. We don't know yet. I'm hoping that at our December meeting, we'll have some um, analysis back from the, from the, uh, the preparatory sub, uh, entity that we've created to give us advice as to whether it makes sense to try to set up subcommittees. Uh, and I should say, we also do have the dates for the next three meetings uh, uh, identified, and there should be notice in the Federal Register on that shortly. So thank you for the question. Well, I hope that everyone um, follows the work of the committee, um, uh, especially how easy it is to listen in all the virtually in all the uh, the public meetings. Um, I think that's one of the benefits of this being a FACA, that all the meetings are going to be public. Um, and so people can fully engage and um, we'll, uh, we'll, of course, also uh, make sure to message out those meeting dates um, on our OIP's blog website. So um, hopefully um, it gets well um, communicated out. Thank you so much. For, since, thank you so much for having me, Bobby. I really appreciate the invitation. I hope that everyone will feel encouraged to, to be in touch. Thank you again. Thank you, Daniel. We really appreciate it. All right. So we'll go on to our next slide. Okay. So as we usually do during these meetings, I just wanted to give some updates from the work um, that we're doing at OIP and OGIS. Um, so just uh, next slide. So we did recently issue new guidance um, and especially one topic of particular importance to this committee or council, um, specifically on um, one of the many duties that chief FOIA officers have written in the statute is to ensure that their agency has sufficient FOIA training um, for their entire workforce. So we issued um, some guidance on that responsibility and how um, chief FOIA officers um, can make sure that they're uh, employees, that their agency employees have sufficient um, training. One of the things that we encourage in the guidance is that <clears throat> there be some level of annual requirement for agency officials, including FOIA officials, to attend substantive FOIA training. Uh, as we all have always said, the FOIA is everyone's responsibility. Um, so the guidance focuses on the fact that we want to make sure um, the appropriate FOIA briefing or training is targeted for the right audience, whether it's a senior executive, agency, uh, an agency um, subject matter official or a FOIA official. Um, and of course, we are here um, to help resource with our to provide resources to all agencies on FOIA training. Um, we, of course, have our regular FOIA training, um, but also have developed e-learning training that is available for all agencies um, and that covers all the entire workforce, a separate e-learning training for senior executives um, one that's aimed for all um, agency professionals and then one in-depth training that's for FOIA professionals. The <clears throat> guidance also um, touches on our uh, well, FOIA websites and ensuring that we are making sure they're current um, and the information is not out of date, as well as the importance of processing requests for expedited um, expedition, uh, adjudicating those requests on a timely and timely in a timely way and um, ensuring that our calculations on how we um, track the timing of those requests in our annual FOIA report is accurate. Next slide. So this time of year, um, FOIA officials, especially those who are um, responsible for the agency's reporting, are in reporting season mode. 
Uh, and so just some reminders of the upcoming deadlines. November 12th is when the 2024 annual FOIA reports are due to OIP. Um, for agencies that receive more than 50 requests, their chief FOIA officer report is due January 13th. All others can submit that by February 7th. The quarter one data um, for FY25 is due January 31. Of course, our guidance on reporting requirements are available on the OIP report page, uh, as well as additional resources, which can be found on OIP's guidance and resources page, uh, including our FOIA self-assessment toolkit. Of course, uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to us. You can call us at 202-514-FOIA. And if it's uh, concerning a, a reporting question, you can ask for our FOIA compliance team. Next slide. So we're very excited to announce the uh, nomination. Um, the nominations are open for the 2025 Sunshine Week Awards. This is the earliest, excuse me, we've advertised it uh, and we're, we're we're hoping to do this um, earlier now so that we can do the vetting process sooner and, 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 and um, notify folks of their awards sooner so that if the travel arrangements need to be made, there's more time for those who are coming um, outside the DC area to join us in the Great Hall on Monday, March 17th, the beginning of Sunshine Week, um, to have our award ceremony. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity for you to recognize exceptional work of your people that have been able to help advance FOIA administration. We have um, five award categories, exceptional service by a FOIA professional or a team of FOIA professionals, outstanding contributions by a new employee, exceptional advancements in IT to improve agencies FOIA administration, exceptional advancements in proactive disclosures, uh, and my favorite, the Lifetime Service Award. Uh, the details on these awards and how to um, submit a nomination are on our blog post website. Next slide. And just a reminder of um, some key resources that are available to your agency and um, for uh, FOIA. Uh, of course, the Department of Justice Guide to the FOIA is continuing to be updated and we'll be completing a full cycle of updates by January. Uh, court decisions, are, our summary of court decisions are regularly being posted. Uh, so between the guide and the summaries of court decisions, um, it's a, those two great resources put together help you stay on top of the latest uh, in FOIA case law. Our guidance, all of our guidance is available on the OIP policy guidance page, uh, as well as on our resources page, we have a number of other resources. For example, our exemption three charts, um, FOIA self-assessment toolkit I mentioned, um, and information about our FOIA counselor service. Next slide. And of course, um, we've been emphasizing training. Uh, OIP continues to provide a significant amount of virtual training that is, uh, covers all aspects of FOIA administration. Our um, registration information for those trainings up to February 2025 are available on the key dates page of our website. Um, if you're not able to attend those trainings, um, the training materials are posted online. But of, of course, again, we have our e-learning training modules and we are always um, open and available to come provide specialized training to your agency upon request. Um, you can reach out to OIP's FOIA training coordinator um, using the same number, 202-514-FOIA, um, if you are interested in uh, uh, consider us considering coming out and providing specialized training. Next slide. So last, I wanted to talk about FOIA.gov. Um, first, some reminders. Uh, uh, the interoperative requirement as agencies are moving into new systems. If you are considering a new case management system um, to make sure that it meets the requirements of um, the API requirements that we need for FOIA.gov and your new system to be interoperable. If you have any questions on that, please, please reach out to us um, and ask for a member of the compliance team. Uh, also, um, each agency has a FOIA.gov agency manager um, responsible for keeping your contact information and links on FOIA.gov updated. So please want a reminder to make sure all your information is on FOIA.gov is updated as requesters and agencies are relying on that information to um, either submit requests or contact you. And of course, as um, uh, Martha mentioned, all the information um, from today's meeting 
and all information regarding Chief Forester's Council is available on FOIA.gov. Next slide. So very excited to kind of um, review now that it's been one full year of the new implementation of our FOIA search tool, how that's been going. Um, it, uh, the results have been really, really great. We've had really great use of the tool. Um, over 120,000 times the tool has been used with 140,000, over 140,000 queries being made through the tool. Um, and it is the fifth most viewed page on FOIA.gov. Next slide. So how it's being used. Um, as many of you who are, are familiar with the search tool um, may know that uh, the way the search tool works is that it has two different ways you can search for either um, records that are already available online or um, where you should go to potentially make a request for those records. Uh, it does this by having a predefined user journey um, for popular topics, um, some of the more most asked about records and make, for example, immigration and immigration and travel records or, or law enforcement records, and then also allowing key term searches, um, which then use machine learning um, based off of published FOIA logs, excuse me, and uh, frequently requested records to help direct the request to the right place. So over the last year of those 140,000 queries, 57% of the requesters are using the predefined journeys. So they've gone to, for example, the immigration and travel records and then answered uh, a couple of questions that then the tool helps them get to the right place. Another 16% use the search term, um, but based off the search term, the tool directed them to one of those predefined user journeys. So we were really happy to see that we, um, our, our theory about the, the predefined user journeys was, was um, came to fruition. And then the main 27% entered the search terms and were provided results based off of the to FOIA logs and frequently requested records. Next slide. So just interesting, some of the top agency components that were selected from the search tool um, were DHS, CUP, USCIS, Department of State, DOD, um, and FBI. Next slide. Now, um, we focused on trying to get requesters to the right place and not necessarily focused only on FOIA. Uh, and so especially in our user journeys, um, we also direct requesters to external resources where it might be more effective or efficient to receive records. And some of the external top external resources um, that have been selected by requesters are the DHS I-94 website, the archives military service records and personnel records, um, people requesting their background investigation, um, IRS records, um, and then uh, background was a big one between DHS and FBI. Next slide. So here you can see that the, the user journeys I mentioned, the top user journeys that were um, that were selected by folks were for international travel records, immigration records law enforcement, um, specifically state and local law enforcement records, and um, background investigations, uh, personnel records. We were particularly happy to see that law enforcement um, was one of the higher ones because we added that later based off of data analytics that indicated that would be the case. Um, so we're happy to um, that, that that's being um, well used. Next slide. And then of course, as I said, um, more and more requests users are using the search term um, and inputting their custom queries, um, any kind of search term or, or type of record that they're looking for that's not specifically or clearly in the user journeys. Um, which brings me to, um, I believe my final slide of what our next steps are. Uh, given that people are using the search term box more and more, um, there's a couple of things that we wanna make sure we do to help improve the search results um, in that function. Um, and we're looking to do this uh, this upcoming year in two different ways. Uh, one, as I mentioned, the, the, the tool partially looks at agencies published FOIA logs in order to help determine where to send a requester, whether uh, which agencies send a requester. And so we are going to be issuing guidance to agencies, uh, encouraging them to post FOIA logs, but also um, in a more uniform format. 
um, so that there's a bit more consistency and that it could um, power the tool better. And then uh, the other part of the data that the tool uses is the publish frequently requested records on your FOIA websites. Um, right now, um, we're basically, it's being powered by looking at the, the title of the document, uh, the link. Um, and so we wanna improve that by using more powerful technology that also considers the content of the records. Um, so those are those are improvements that we're looking to, um, or those are the uh, improvements we're looking to accomplish um, in 2025. Next slide. Um, and that's those are the updates that we had from OIP. Um, unless there's any questions, I don't see any in the chat. I can hand it over to Martha. Thanks, Bobby. Um, I just want to start off by saying for those of you who are watching us live streaming on YouTube. We understand there was a problem at the beginning of the meeting. I just want to assure you that this event is being recorded and that the full version will be uploaded to YouTube shortly after the conclusion of the meeting. So sorry for that. We will correct it as soon as the meeting is done. And we are on track right now. So next slide, please. This Chief FOIA Officers Council meeting is the first held since the FOIA Advisory Committee concluded its fifth term in June and voted to recommend four specific actions to the Chief FOIA Officers Council. Unlike this council, whose membership is, governed, is government only, uh, the committee com comprises 20 members from both inside and outside government who advise the Archivist of the United States on improvements to FOIA administration government-wide. In its final report and recommendations, the 2022 to 2024 term of the FOIA Advisory Committee recognized the Chief FOIA Officer Council as an important actor in the FOIA administration and directed four recommendations to the council, which we're gonna go over. I'm pleased to report that work has already begun on some of these four recommendations. So we're just gonna briefly present them to you here. First, recommendation 2024-06 suggested that the council, through its Committee on Cross-Agency Collaboration and Innovation, which is a mouthful, so we call that Kokaki, organize agencies to participate in a talent pool posting through OPM. So what is a talent pool? A talent pool is a new feature on USA Jobs whereby agencies can participate in a shared job posting. Applicants who have been assessed as eligible are then available for consideration by any of the participating agencies. This recommendation was developed by the FOIA Advisory Committee Resources Subcommittee, which was co-chaired by Paul Chalmers with the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Paul is no longer on the FOIA Advisory Committee, but I am thrilled to report that he is co-chairing COCACI with Michael Bell of the Department of Transportation. And with that new hat he wears, Paul can work on implementing a recommendation he works so hard on. So the next one, second, recommendation 2024-07 is also for Kokaki, uh, which the FOIA Advisory Committee suggested should create and maintain a database on its website of position descriptions in the Government Information Specialist, GIS, job series at various grades. While no action has yet been taken on this, it's on COCACI's agenda for fiscal year 25. Third, recommendation 2024-11 recommends that the Chief FOIA Officers Council form a working group to analyze the interest in and need for a shared FOIA case management system and a centralized records repository for use by the federal agencies and the public. I'm pleased to report that a working group of the Chief FOIA Officers Council Technology Committee has been formed to work on this issue. It's being led by former FOIA Advisory Committee member Patricia Webb, also of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, who has had a hand in this recommendation coming to fruition. The working group is tasked with studying the issue, writing a white paper of findings, and presenting it to the CFO Council. The goal is for the working group's white paper to create a strong business case for initiating a shared federal agency FOIA case management system and centralized records repository. Fourth, recommendation 2024-12 recommends that the Chief FOIA Officers Council Technology Committee and interested agencies 
publish requests for information or RFIs on the subject of artificial intelligence tools and techniques as an aid to FOIA processing. This is on the Tech Committee's agenda for this fiscal year. And the FOIA Advisory Committee has passed a total of 67 recommendations and OGIS maintains a dashboard for tracking the progress of these recommendations. Next slide, please. We recently updated this dashboard and um, it will show that we've completed 33 recommendations, which is about half. 15 recommendations are in progress, 14 are pending, the remaining five are on hold or have been rejected. We urge you to take a quick look at this dashboard. It's got a lot, got a lot of great information there. So now I'm going to pass the presentation on to Lindsay Steele from DOJ OIP to discuss the FOIA business standards effort. Next slide, please. Great. Thank you, Martha. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lindsay Steele, Chief of the FOIA Compliance Staff at OIP, and I have been um, heading up alongside, actually, Martha to lead the FOIA Business Standards Working Group, um, and I'm pleased to be here to report out on our progress. So you can go to the next slide, please. So if you recall, uh, we assembled an interagency working group as part of this council to develop FOIA business standards in line with the federal integrated business framework. Um, for more info, you can click on that link, but the purpose of the standards is to help provide or define rather different elements that are um, possible requirements for agency FOIA case management systems. Um, and so in thinking about FOIA technology, uh, we chose to focus this in initial set of standards on FOIA case management systems, since that is like the most widely, uh, widely used type of FOIA technology. And so we identified the key areas of FOIA administration as it relates to FOIA case management needs. Um, and then within each of those key areas developed very detailed business standards. And so the way that um, I like to think about the business standards is, is to look at them as, as building blocks. Um, so we tried in developing the business standards to address all of the many possible needs that an agency might have as part of their FOIA case management system so that then agencies have uh, the language and requirements defined that they can use and piece together what makes the most sense for their own needs. Um, we did circulate these for comment among the Chief Boy Officers Council, and so I do thank all of you who reviewed and provided feedback and comments on those standards. They are now pending, uh, they also went through public comment, um, and we did not receive any public comments, but we did get some feedback from the other members of the um, business standards uh, committee. And so we were able to incorporate uh, some feedback from some of our counterparts to make sure that the standards that we have in FOIA are consistent with standards that may exist across the other areas, such as financial management. So now uh, we're very happy that the standards are now pending final approval with OMB. And once approved, they will be published on the uh, FIBIF FOIA website, where anyone will be able to go on and, and see all of, the, um, all of the business capabilities. And we really encourage you to take those and you know, incorporate them into your, um, into your business requirements as you're looking for new solutions. Um, and then also for vendors, it can be a great resource for them as, as they're looking to uh, develop solutions that can hopefully meet agencies' needs more effectively. You can go to the next slide, please. So for this current fiscal year 2025, um, we have a, a few plans. So first, we would like to reconstitute and refresh the working group. Um, we've kind of had the original working group for a couple of years now. And so if you are if you are willing to stay on, we are happy to, to keep you on if you have been involved in it. Um, if you are new uh, or would be newly interested in joining us on the working group, please reach out to us at OIP. Um, we would be happy to have you join us. Um, it's really important to us that this working group kind of compose like a broad cross section of the agencies so that we can hear from a range of agency experiences as we are developing further elements of the standards. 
So you can see here this wheel, the FIBIF wheel has the different elements of business standards. And so we've completed uh, the first two. So the federal business life cycle and business capabilities. Um, and we are now moving on to the business use cases. And so that is what we will work to develop uh, this fiscal year. And what the business use cases are, um, they basically take the standards and work them up into you know, use cases so you can see kind of how they, how they work in action. Um, and that just can provide additional um, kind of illustration uh, for agencies and vendors to understand how all of these standards work together. We're also going to be thinking about how we can uh, perhaps do some outreach to the commercial vendors um, to try to make them aware of these standards and facilitate greater engagement. Um, ideally, you know, the vendors will be familiar with these standards. And so if an agency comes to them and says, you know, here, here's the FOIA business standards, this is what I want our case management system to look like, um, then the vendors are familiar with that. And of course, we want to be developing these in a way that they can be implemented by the vendors as well. And so having their um, having their input can be can be really helpful. All right. So with that, um, that uh, kind of summarizes where we're at with the FOIA business standards. We look forward to working on them uh, over the next year. And again, uh, if you're interested in joining us in this effort, please do reach out uh, to OIP and we'd be happy to get you looped in. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. <clears throat> uh, just check the chat real quick if there's any questions. I don't see any. Okay, all right. So let's now turn to our report outs from our two committees, both of which have been hard at work since we last met. We will first hear from Michael Sarich, co-chair of the Technology Committee, who will report on the work of that committee. He'll go hand off the baton to Michael Bell, reporting out as co-chair of the Committee on Cross-Agency Collaboration and Innovation, COCACI. Uh, but before we launch into our report outs, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Abi Oela, former Kokaki co-chair who stepped down at the end of fiscal year 2024. We're very grateful for Abby's exceptional dedication and hard work as a founding co-chair of the Kokaki. And again, thanks, Abby, for your tireless efforts, dedication, and commitment to the success of Kokaki. Um, we are pleased, as Martha said, to that Paul Chalmers will be uh, taking the role of the co-chair um, and are excited to welcome him into this new role. But with that, I'll hand it over, over to you, Mike. Well, thanks so much, Bobby. It's great to be here to uh, share some updates and report out on the Chief FOIA Officers Technology Committee. Um, I'm Michael Sarich, one of the founding co-chairs of the committee, and I'm currently serving alongside, as Bobby mentioned, Gorka Garcia Malone, who cannot be here today. However, he sends his uh, warm regards and is excited for, uh, for us to share the uh the some information and some updates from the uh, technology committee so if we could have the next slide please okay great so just as a refresher the committee was established to help bring tech awareness and adoption to foia programs and i, I want to share this quote from um the other co-founder of our committee eric stein that i think really encapsulates what we're all about in the um the tech committee and he says that it's not technology alone that's going to solve many of the problems we're facing with the challenges of backlogs, increased requests, the increased volume of electronic data, but really understanding what are the challenges, what are the processes, what are the workflows, and what are the options available with technology, and through that, the innovation that ensues. And at the Tech Committee, we've seen a ton of innovation since our inception, and I'm going to kind of highlight some of those achievements. You can see them on this slide here, some of the things that... Um, we're kind of most proud of. Of course, most recently in May of 2024, we had the Next Gen FOIA Tech Showcase 2.0, and we're going to talk um, a lot about that here in, in, in the next couple of slides. Of course, that was birthed from the original uh, Next Gen FOIA Tech Showcase in 2022 and some workshops that we did. Um, our first report ever was the February 14th, the Valentine gift to uh, the FOIA community on some best practices and recommendations, kind of our uh, inaugural uh, publication. And of course, the tech committee for years has been interested in artificial intelligence and e-discovery and things of that uh, sort to bring technology to um, agencies uh, to utilize in their FOIA programs. So next slide, please. 
So I want to focus a bit more on the on, on the showcase, as, as I mentioned. As we move from paper to full-on electronically stored information or ESI, we knew that we know that new tools are required to create the innovation Eric talked about um, in FOIA. And that's what the next gen showcase attempts to do. FOIA has obviously changed dramatically since it became operative in 1967. We're living, working, and governing in an electronic world. And FOIA tools and technology must serve us in the world that we exist in, not the 1967 version of that same world. And of course, the statute has changed dramatically in uh, in that many uh, in, in through those many years. So on FOIA.gov, you can um, you'll be able to go into um, and see all the vendors that presented materials and more. And I want to kind of show you an example of what that uh, looks like here. So next slide, please. So what we were able to do and what we've been able to do. Uh, through FOIA.gov is have a list of all the vendors that presented at the Next Gen Showcase and as an agency ourselves that are posting um, RFPs. This is a great resource for FOIA professionals to begin market research to kind of see what's possible. Uh, particularly interesting to a number of programs is the interface of e-discovery solutions as applied to FOIA programs. And we'll talk more about that in just a bit from an, a FOIA Advisory Committee uh, recommendation. Um, but as a preview, though, FOIA programs really wrestle with every bit and, and bite of data that their agencies and departments produce. So technology that has, excuse me, an enterprise-wide inclusive approach is, is really critical as we move forward. And we see a lot of that in the e-discovery-related tools. And if you watch some of the videos and uh, take that time to, to take advantage of that resource, you'll see that for yourself. Of course, there's, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a very healthy dose of AI and that's the kind of innovation that I think Eric was talking about, uh, technology enhancing or even reimagining workflows and the innovation that, that comes kind of from the uh, alchemy of insight into operations and then the application of technology to those operations. Kind of only then do we get the insight we need to empower the innovation that's required to keep up with the record number of requests, uh, you know, in a budget format that it has uncertain resource allocations. Everyone uh, lives in different uh, resource allocation situations and this technology can really pr uh, provide force multipliers to meet them to meet the mission so kind of in five minute chunks you get an overview of of different products and their potential to serve your program's needs and in addition to just the videos which are a great resource and when you're time crunched you know you can just maybe get a few minutes to to look at one or two or three of them you also can read the written submissions on foia.gov and this is just how the, the tech committee is trying to provide value to the, um, the FOIA community. And there's a number of other ways that the committee has, has sought to provide value over the last year and since its inception. And to kind of bridge into that, I'd like to talk about some of the working groups next uh, before we give you a preview of what's on tap here uh, in FY25. So next slide, please. So these are the working groups that exist on the, the FOIA Tech Committee. We have a data working group, 508 Compliance and Collaborative Tools, FOIA and Classified Information, FOIA IT Platforms, FOIA Reference Model, Search Artificial Intelligence, and Technology Best Practices. So these working groups, all of them have associated charters and papers um, that they've produced and are in the process of, of producing really to give folks uh, in the FOIA field a chance to say, hey, I'm interested in 508. 508 is a challenge for us. What's the tech committee say? In addition to just that baseline information, it also provides FOIA officers with a resource to point to when we're having conversations with leadership. Hey, we need to make sure that we're 508 compliant. Here's a, re here's a report uh, from FOIA.gov from the tech committee that says, Here's the kind of the steps that you need to take. And also the authors of these um, of these tools, of these papers, have been very open with sharing information. So you'll see an a paper uh, that might be authored by someone like Virginia Burke. And you can just reach out to Virginia Burke and she'll she's super, uh, super happy and awesome to work with and can help you um, with that. And that's the same for all of the uh, the authors, Paul Leviton. It just, the list goes on for the authors of these papers and their willingness to work and provide assistance to, to their friends throughout the, the FOIA community. All right, so next slide, please. We'll talk a little bit about what we're working on in the tech committee in FY25, kind of what our focus is, what are we gonna be spending our time doing? How are we gonna try and deliver value to the FOIA community in FY25? So I'm um, so curious and kind of highlighted some of these and we're gonna um, walk through them 
quickly, just so you can get a, a sense and a vibe of kind of coming attractions, things that people are working on right now today to, to bring value to the FOIA community. So next slide, please. First, what we've decided to do is really focus on FOIA advisory committee recommendations. And you've seen this, this image before. This is an awesome uh, dashboard. If you're not familiar with it, uh, you can go on um, an o the OGIS site, FOIA, and you can also go on FOIA.gov, I think, and, and get, to, get to this information. Just Google FOIA advisory committee recommendations dashboard if you're looking for it. I think we can also provide some links if needed. Really, you get a sense of what uh, a really good group of dedicated folks think the FOIA community um, needs, and it's really a good place to track that progress. It's super impressive the amount of green on this dashboard to be candid, and you know many of the the recommendations that you know are brand new. And so, of course, you see as you go, uh, the more recent are things that are in works and are uh, in the process of of being accomplished. Our goal on the committee is to help bring those um, those recommendations to support those recommendations and to bring them to fruition all for the benefit of the work that that we do across the government the million three or so 1.3 million or so requests that we'll probably get this year to help uh, professionals in that in those efforts so let's talk about some of the specific things that we're going to do in support of the recommendations dashboard and as a way to help improve FOIA uh, program management and FOIA program service delivery across the federal uh, government. So next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about these uh, these kind of core four before we get into um, really ex some really exciting additional uh, additional ones. So the first one is 24-12. Um, we usually just refer to these as like say dash 12. So dash 12 is an RFI on the subject of AI tools and techniques as an aid to FOIA processing. Well, as I showed you on the on the, the, the second slide, the tech committee has been interested in exploring AI since at least 2000. Uh, former member Nick Wittenberg gave a, a great presentation and kind of a walkthrough on a, the technology assistant, assisted review from the PEC uh, decision down, how agencies can employ it. Obviously, since 2000, the world has changed dramatically in AI, and the ability and utility of tools has also um, has also uh, exploded. So, we're going to take a new look at this again here this year in FY25, and we've already drafted the RFI for this, going through approval, and we we want to get this information out with this very laser specific focus on AI to say, hey, how can we take this uh, this great innovation and apply it for records is it really is it just can you give me a summary of a 10,000 uh, document request so i can be more focused in in my um in my work or what tools can we do that that embrace safe ai and also impactful ai so kind of those twin um tensions making sure that it's safe and that we're not going to lose uh, critical and sensitive information but also provide effective insights to foia professionals so they can utilize the uh, artificial intelligence um, gains and really make a difference for their programs. Dash 11, I think, is a really important and powerful uh, recommendation to analyze the interest and need for a shared FOIA case management system and a centralized records repository for use by federal agencies and the public. The idea that um, there's so many FOIA case management tools, as I showed you on the on the previous slide, some 24 uh, different vendors coming to um, to the government to pitch different software things and some, you know, uh, different people have different opinions on different products and obviously we're not here to endorse anyone and we don't. Um, however, looking at the need, the potential need and the interest in a common case platform, we think is very interesting. It could lead to uh, career portability for, for many folks. You could work in one agency and if you have that common case platform, it's very easy. Uh, even just on the career side to plug and play into another agency and you know move on with your career because you there's no learning curve of going from product A to product B to product C. You have that expertise. And in addition to that, the size of the market could potentially drive some serious innovation and some serious efficiencies, reducing costs and delivering better value to taxpayers. So there's a real interest there in Dash 11 as well. 22-9, uh, the council should establish a working group to recommend resolutions and challenges between FOIA and Section 508 compliance. And there's a real tension there again in the push and pull and ag many agencies um, struggle with uh, making sure that the information that they produce, the release to one is released to all, 
and that the documents, the additional processing time often that it takes to, to take a large corpus of records and make them 508 compliant. Um, well, new tools have come onto the scene to help in that mission, and we want to make sure that we're highlighting those, promoting those, and, and making people aware of them, I guess, not really promoting, but in short, promoting awareness, I guess, is the best way of saying it, of these tools that can help folks in this um, in 508 compliance, because many people do struggle with it. And again, if the technology can be a value add for a FOIA program, we want to make sure that 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 information is highlighted and people have the ability to access that information and utilize it. Uh, dash eight is awesome. The um, the working group to determine best practices for release of records in native format, including metadata. So much of the information, the ESI, the electronically stored information that we collect, has additional value to the public. Um, you know, if it's in its native format, they're able to take that data that the American taxpayer has paid for and per perhaps bring innovation into other areas. So. Dash eight is a really interesting um, recommendation, and I'm really excited personally to see where we go on on that one. Perhaps the most exciting one for me is uh, the next one that we're going to pick up. So next slide, please. OK, e-discovery. So 2020-11, we've done some work on this, but we're going to formalize it in this in this cycle. Um, guidance on, to agencies on the use of e-discovery tools to assist agencies in their searches of electronic records in response to FOIA requests. Written widely on this, and we've put a lot of information out in the, um, in, you know, in, in the world as it is, in terms of the similarities of the workflows between e-discovery and FOIA. Uh, we don't want to go, don't need to go into them here. However, the, the workflows are very, very similar, and e-discovery has a long track record, the e-discovery reference model. Then we get the begat the FOIA reference model uh, that might have recently produced. So kind of tracking those and providing some real guidance to saying, hey, here's here's the similarities in the workflows. Here's how you can take the tried and, and true and trusted um, results legally defensible in the e-discovery world and apply them to FOIA. And it might make sense for your agency. Again, increasing that where, awareness of the technology so that, as Eric mentioned, innovation can then occur. So we're really excited, uh, really excited about that. And the excitement is really driven because the FOIA Tech Committee is a member driven committee. The interest in the members are paramount. And, you know, again, like any committee, um, what the you get out of the committee is what you kind of put into it. So uh, next slide, please. And as Mike Bell, I'm sure would say too on Kokaki, we want you. Uh, if you're watching this and you're a member of the federal FOIA family on the government side, of course, uh, and you're interested in technology, you're interested in networking with other like-minded uh, FOIA professionals who are interested in improving the process and the product that they that they deliver. You know, taking the five taking five USC five five two and then using all the tools available to ensure that we're delivering on that mandate and, and ensuring that we get to, um, you know, reasonable productions in a timely manner. The technology committee is really for you. It's a great place to be. So if you have an interest, please um, uh, reach out and um, Gorka and I would be delighted to have you join us in um, any of the roles or the working groups that we have. I've outlined some of the great work that the members have done throughout the years and then kind of uh, previewed some of the work that will be coming in the next year. So if any of that interests you, well, we want you. So please come on board. And uh, with that, I'll be happy to uh, transfer over transfer the uh, the virtual podium over to Mr. Bell for a um, an update on Kokaki. I really appreciate the opportunity again, Bobby, to to come and present on some of the great work that's been done by so many of the members of the Chief Water Officers Technology Committee. I remain grateful for the opportunity to be a part of it and the joy that we get from um, from delivering for from delivering to the FOIA community. So thanks so much. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My, my name is Mike Bell, and I am the uh, FOIA officer for the Department of Transportation. And I have been the co-chair of Kokaki since its uh, creation about over three years ago. Uh, we were uh, a recommendation from the FOIA Advisory Committee, uh, basically because we were created because everyone knows that FOIA people and FOIA offices all around the government 
are coming up with good solutions, good ideas, methods of doing things. And it's the government. We're spread out. It's hard to communicate those uh, things to each other. And so Kokaki is trying to bridge some of that distance, trying to create ways that uh, an office, you know, on one side of the government spectrum can uh, access what uh, another office is doing. And uh, so far, uh, we've had some uh, good productivity so far, some good products out there, and we're going to have some more coming up. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, my my former co-chair, Abby. She had to uh, drop out of the committee, uh, but she was there from the uh, very beginning and was instrumental in all that we've accomplished. And I'd like to introduce uh, our new co-chair, Paul Chalmers. Uh, he's from the uh, Pension and Benefit Guarantee Corporation, Deputy General Counsel there. There he is. Paul, if you'd like to say hello, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm As Michael said, I'm Paul Chalmers. I'm Deputy General Counsel and Chief FOIA Officer at the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Uh, I spent the last two years on the advisory committee, and now I'm here to, <laughs> I'm here to work on the recommendations that we made uh, from the advisory committee. I look forward to working with everyone. Uh, Michael and everybody else on Kokaki and everybody else in the, in the council. Uh, I'll turn it back to Michael. Great. Thanks, Paul. And uh, again, Paul is very dedicated. Uh, he was, as he said, he was on the FOIA advisory committee who gave a couple of recommendations we're going to work on. Uh, most people, when they come up with ideas and give it to a committee to work on, they don't get involved. They just turn it over to the committee. But Paul decided to go ahead and join the committee that he uh, gave the ideas to. So it'll be good to have him with us. Uh, and I will say right now, this is sort of a transition time for Kokaki. Uh, you'll see a lot of our first uh, generation products are either completed or about to be completed in the next few weeks. So we're now going to be looking at our, uh, our next steps. Uh, and so having Paul's fresh ideas in will be very good. And uh, as Michael said about the technology committee, uh, we're looking for volunteers. This is a good time uh, to join Kokaki. Uh, this is where we're looking for that new direction. We've got three subcommittees that I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Uh, I said, they're putting a lot of good stuff out there. I think things that uh, once they're accessed by FOIA offices uh, will make a difference. So now where do we go from here? Uh, so we think there's a lot out there that we can still do. And so we're looking for uh, good ideas. So uh, next slide, please. All right. I'd first like to uh, talk about our first uh, subcommittee, uh, the GIS professionalization uh, subcommittee. Uh, this has been the most popular one for the members because uh, people are passionate for the GIS career field because it does affect so many of us. Uh, the GIS career field is only a few years old. Uh, I remember working on uh, position descriptions back three or four jobs ago when I was at the Department of Defense. I helped uh, write the new ones over there when we were getting the, uh, the designation. And it's grown so much and it's now, I think, fully accepted that GIS, FOIA people, however you want to call them, it is a professional career field, and having this uh, job series just helps with that. And But since it's still new, we still need ideas. We still near, need ways to, uh, to really recruit and hire, uh, develop, and maintain uh, good FOIA people. So uh, they've uh, been working on a white paper, uh, and that comes from after uh, interviewing uh, FOIA leadership from around the government. Uh, they met with a lot of chief FOIA officers, FOIA officers. Uh, they helped participate in our survey that we conducted uh, about a year and a half ago. And basically, we polled everyone who worked in FOIA, who responded, of course, uh, with ideas on what's important to them, uh, what's, what brought them to the career field, what's keeping them there, and even why they might leave it. And all these things that they've been doing for the last uh, year or so in this paper uh, is about to come uh, to fruition. We are hoping to have it published by today, uh, but you know how things go. Sometimes uh, there's just some uh, last minute delays, but probably within the next two weeks, there will be a GIS, GIS uh, white paper, and we'll make sure that it's, uh, it's gonna be linked on FOIA.gov. Uh, we'll make sure that's publicized and people can access it. And we hope it'll give some good ideas for the GIS career field. Uh, once that paper is uh, published uh, in, I'll say since we're already in fiscal year 25, in calendar year 25, uh, the committee is looking to have sort of like a GIS career day, uh, just a day to promote and discuss the GIS career field within the FOIA community. 
Uh, it's something similar to our resources committee where we had uh, panels regarding how to access resources, which I'll get to in a minute. But we want a day just to promote and uh, just answer questions about the GS career field. And so I think that would be a good day where uh, people from around the government who work in FOIA can come together and have their questions answered and hear what's going on in other agencies. Uh, we'll also, uh, I'll get to it later on, uh, but the recommendations uh, that we talked about Paul uh, giving us, uh, we're gonna be working on them and this subcommittee is gonna lead those efforts. And I'll get to that uh, a little bit later on. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, our pandemic and uh, virtual FOIA office uh, subcommittee. Um, the FOIA office was left off, it just says virtual. Uh, I know some people think maybe uh, virtual reality goggles or the holodeck on Star, Star Trek, uh, but basically the pandemic uh, changed the way uh, all of government uh, operated uh, from going to five days a week in the office to five days at home. Uh, but now uh, that we're in a hybrid situation, we wanted to make sure that there was a uh, collection and uh, analysis of the best practices that worked during the pandemic that we can now bring along to the hybrid FOIA offices that we have now. Uh, they're also creating or finalizing a uh, paper on that as well. Uh, we've made uh, most of the edits and it's about to go to OGIS and DOJ for their input. So we hope to have that paper published early in 2025 calendar year. Again, especially uh, uh, as people are coming back to the office, we wanna make sure that the lessons learned from the pandemic are not forgotten and that we can apply them today. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, our resources subcommittee. Uh, this one was created because, you know, with all the FOIA offices out there, we have some large ones, uh, like say the Department of Transportation, uh, where we have access to a lot of resources. You know, some of the other larger agencies, State Department, Department of Defense, uh, they don't have trouble finding or accessing some of the resources out there. And we're not just talking uh, money or technology, uh, just uh, products and ways to do things. So this subcommittee was created so that especially some of the smaller offices uh, would be able to find some of these resources that are out there because most of the FOIA offices out there are one person offices. Uh, you know, it's a solo job and maybe they got other side duties as well. And it's hard for them to go to all the conferences. It's hard for them to... Uh, really participate in discussions because they've got their hands in so many projects that it's tough for them. And so this subcommittee is to make it easier to uh, access everything that's out there to help us do our jobs better. Now this subcommittee uh, recently, uh, about a year ago, recent in uh, FOIA time, uh, they had a best practices workshop where we had uh, individuals from all around the government come in and talk on panels. And they just told about um, getting resources for their FOIA offices and it, you know where to find them, what's important, what you should focus on, really just how to keep the FOIA offices running efficiently. And that was very successful. We had uh, hundreds of people listen in and take part uh, and it was a great success. Now they've been building on that since then. Uh, what they're working on now is to create a reference library for FOIA professionals. Uh, this reference library is going to be uh, staffed so I'm sorry, hosted uh, on FOIA.gov. So everyone will be able to access it. And basically it's gonna consolidate uh, things like FOIA policy, materials, uh, information on acquisitions, uh, backlog reduction plans, any resources that a FOIA office could use. And we're gonna take advantage of FOIA.gov to make sure it's in a central place where everyone knows where to look for it. So that's uh, going to come out hopefully in spring of 2025. So just a few months away. And again, we're gonna make sure it's publicized and the people know where to access these uh, resources and use them for your FOIA offices. Uh, next slide, please. All right, uh, FOIA Toolkit Working Group. Uh, Abby is not co-chair anymore, but she is still heading up this FOIA Toolkit Working Group. Uh, this was established in FY23. And basically, their goal was to draft a guide for FOIA professionals to better recruit, develop, and retain FOIA talent. So they're working hand in hand with the GIS subcommittee that we have. And this working group has reviewed over 40 agency position descriptions. Uh, they've uh, collected a bunch of sample interview questions for job interviews for candidates. And 
They've also been tracking a year's worth of USA Jobs data so far on FOIA recruitment. And they're coming up uh, with a project and their release is gonna be just in January, 2025. And that's gonna go um, work right into the GIS subcommittee and the FOIA advisory committee recommendations. Next slide, please. Which we're going right now. Uh, there were two of them that uh, Martha read earlier, uh, but basically it was recommendation six and seven. And recommendation six basically wants us to create a talent pool and uh, posting through OPM. And we've already got a lot of the data there. We've already got a lot of the infrastructure that we wanna put into that. And so that'll also be hopefully completed in uh, this fiscal year. Uh, the second one, uh, recommendation seven, uh, that was create a GIS position, de position description database. And as I said, that's already been collected from the GIS subcommittee. They've got a head start on that. Uh, collecting it for their white paper, and we're also using it for the, uh, the FOIA working group. So we're already got a decent start on these recommendations. And again, they both focus on the GIS career field, which is uh, important to uh, everyone who works in FOIA because you have to take care of your people if you want them to want to keep them and make sure that uh, they're motivated to do a good job. And I think a lot of what uh, Kokaki is going to put out this coming year uh, we'll focus on that. And I hope in the April uh, Chief Way Officer Council meeting, we'll be able to give updates and all these things that were put out between now and then. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, uh, as Michael said, uh, we are the same way in Kokaki. We could use some new members. As I said, we're at a decision point right now. Uh, where do we go? What new ideas are we going to do once we get these products out in the next few months from all three subcommittees? Uh, so please let us know if you'd like to join. Uh, I know for the, uh, the hybrid working group, uh, one thing that I really want to create now maybe is maybe a pet behavior uh, working group, because uh, basically I've been giving this uh, briefing with a cat tugging at my pants leg. Uh, and I think we all uh, could use help uh, managing our home offices when we're working from here. So maybe that's going to be our uh, next idea. Uh, so that's it for the Kokaki brief. Uh, any questions from anyone? Okay, good. Now back to managing my work-life balance and keeping uh, uh, my pet uh, in tow for now. So thank you, everyone. And I look forward to anyone who'd like to work with us in the future. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and thanks to both Michaels and Paul for um, the readouts of the two committees. We are a little bit ahead of time, but we've now reached the public comment section of our meeting. We did promise to leave time for that. Um, and so happy to do that. We look forward to hearing from any members of the public who have ideas or comments um, that they would like to share. I also want to remind everyone that you may also submit written comments to the using the comment submission forum on OGIS's website. Uh, before submitting public comments, please do be sure to read the posting policy for public comments. Oral comments presented to the Chief Warrior Officer Council are available in the meeting transcripts that will be posted on FOIA.gov in the video of the council meeting posted on NARA's YouTube channel. Great, so we'd like to open up our telephone line now to begin. So Candace, if you could, please provide instructions for our listeners on how to ask the question or make a comment um, orally via telephone or, or through the website. Absolutely, my pleasure. As we begin the public comment period, please click the raise hand icon located at the bottom of your screen to join the queue. You'll be given three minutes to make your remarks. You will hear a tone when your line is unmuted, at which time please state your name and affiliation, then make your comments. If you're not using WebEx audio, you may press pound two on your telephone keypad to join the queue. To assist you, there will be a timer on the right side of your screen. It will begin counting down as soon as you start your remarks, and you will hear a five-second warning when your time is up. Great. Um, before, so we're giving people some time to raise their hand. Dan, um, I don't believe I saw any comments um, in the WebEx chat, but I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. I didn't, there are no comments in the WebEx chat. Excellent. Great. So, Candace, do we have anyone with a raised hand right now? 
At this time, there are no hands raised either on WebEx or on the phone line. Give it maybe 30 more seconds. Sure, we'll just give it some time. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, you may press the raise hand icon here on WebEx, or if your audio is through the phone only, press pound two on your telephone keypad. All right, well, not seeing any calls. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for joining. I'm uh, sorry to interrupt, for... we did just get a hand raise. Oh, okay. Great. Bonnie Smith, your line is open. My name is attorney Bonnie B. Smith of Verlaine Law in Las Vegas, Nevada. I was just wondering, um, given the recent results from the presidential election, if you feel like there will be any changes. I know some of the speakers said they had a meeting a month ago or in the what I would consider present future. So based on an incoming administration, do you believe there'll be any of the ch any changes to the plans and protocol that you've laid out today? Well, at this point, I don't have any um, indication that there would be any changes, but of course, you know, we have to go through a transition and, um, but our, our plan is to, to keep the work going ahead. There are no further hands raised. All right. Well, thank you. Again, thanks everyone for joining for a really great meeting today. Uh, and uh, thank you to Daniel Schumann, our community co-chairs, Michael Sarich and Michael Bell and Paul Chimers for joining as well. Uh, and special thanks to all you FOIA professionals and FOIA officials who are volunteering your time to serve on the two councils, the council's two committees, and for all the great work that you're doing. Um, just one last plug. Again, please do reach out to us if you would like to join one of the committees. Um, and I think we can close out. Martha, over to you. Thanks, Bobby. So we hope to see you all again this spring. We'll have another CFO Council public meeting at that time. Please stay tuned for further announcements on the exact date and time, as well as registration information. Thanks again. I joined Bobby thanking everyone uh, for joining us today. I hope everyone and their families remain safe and healthy and resilient. I think that closes us out. Thank you. Bye, everybody. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using Intel or events. You may now disconnect.